Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. We are continuing our consideration of S-124. Um, today we have a couple of municipal chiefs of police um, to talk with us about their perspectives on uh, the various aspects of the bill. Um, and so first off, we have the uh, newly minted uh, chief of police of Montpelier, Vermont. So uh, thanks for coming all the way to our Zoom room. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I'm honored and humbled. So we have various aspects of um, 124 that we would like to hear from uh, local law enforcement on um, because we recognize that um, that some of these reforms when fully implemented will uh, will will hit differently on smaller departments than on larger departments uh, or the Vermont State Police. So uh, we would love to hear any thoughts that you have to share on uh, on the various aspects of the bill. Okay, I, I sincerely, again, thank you very much for the opportunity. It was, it's a, it's a, it's a lengthy bill, so I, I guess I would, I can start in with some general um, thoughts, if I may, and then, uh, then if there are any specific questions I can answer in, in relation to um, any of the topics, I, I would definitely, uh, can definitely do that as well. Great. Um, in regard to um, overall, I, I think that what I've found since I've been here is that um, the culture here in the uh, within the institution of policing in the state of Vermont is working to get on board um, with 21st century policing concepts, and that's that's very encouraging. That it's that's we're trying to be proactive and uh, in, in moving forward in this direction. We just want to do it in a very smart way. Um, so that that's given me a lot of <laughs> it, it, it's it's given me a lot of faith and confidence that that um, our institution will will implement the changes that we need to do. Um, with uh, so in looking at um, data collection requirements that um, I think from my understanding we have two primary case and records management systems which are Valcor and um, Spillman, and I think that um, each one of those uh, systems has, from my understanding of both, has the, the flexibility to build in uh, points in which this data needs to be collected. But it's, uh, so the question is what data needs to, uh, is, is want to be collected, and then just to make sure so that data is captured, um, you, you make it so that um, it's just, it's a mandatory field to be, uh, to be put in. I think with um, with smaller locations that may not be able to afford these these systems, if there are some that don't have them, that gives more opportunity to gather this data that you otherwise may not have in more rural locations. Um, if the state were able to help that agency in getting those case and records management systems, and that would be that would give you more opportunity to collect the data to mandate that data. Um, Regarding to dispatch fees, I understand that this has been um, uh, uh, this has been an issue that's been uh, this the state has been trying to work through. I do know that um, in talking to some of my peers uh, and meeting them, um, they're, they're like everyone else is dealing with fiscal restraints. Uh, so uh, it's 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 difficult for them. But then I understand that the burden that it's putting on, uh, for example, like state police and and doing dispatch services. So. Um, I, I think some of the things that here that are outlined in the bill, uh, some of them are, you know, thought well, but I would have to probably defer to anyone, especially in the more rural locations to see how um, for their specific input for that. Um, and then allowing non law enforcement members, I think, I think look, civ civilian oversight is the crux of, of what government should be. And so I, I, I believe um, that there should be definite civilian oversight, or that there should be definite civilian involvement. Oversight, on the other hand, I'm not, it depends because it's, there are, to, in my perspective, you already have an elected officials um, in each town or in each city that is, that are responsible ultimately for, they, they have the direct control. And if anything happens within that agency, they may not have the control, you know, 
or, or the opportunity to, uh, if you have a, like a direct oversight board that the only thing they're responsible for is uh, police discipline and, and, and strategic planning and, and, and everything else above, how can they be held liable if they have no control over the department if it's given to a, uh, another board that's not elected? So I, I think that there, there definitely needs to be civilian involvement in law enforcement and moving forward in strategic planning, but I'm not sure if direct civilian oversight control um, is going to be fair to anyone who has been elected constituent uh, elected by the constituency and who is held accountable to the people rather than a board that may be appointed that that may not be. Uh, and then I think in, in regards to um, there, there's a lot in here that talks about um, uh, training and talks about certification. Uh, Vermont uh, coming here again was a was a breath of fresh air and how the, uh, the there were there were more times culture was emphasized over everything else. It was the foundation of this is what we do in Vermont. This is how we police. This is mutual respect. This is dignity, and then everything else is built on that. So when we talk about use of force. We talk about those things. Personal stories were being shared. Again, like putting uh, adult-based learning practices, like how would you want, what officer do you want to respond when your family's in crisis? That's the officer you need to be when you show up. So that was, I was extremely impressed with what the Academy was doing, but there, the resources there um, are, <laughs> they're, they're a little far few in between for what they have to operate with, which is concerning because if you don't establish a strong base if you don't don't invest in that foundation everything else afterward is just gonna it's gonna be trash in trash out respectfully um but uh, those these types of things have to also be weighed with adult again adult-based learning practices that um i i think th there are younger folks who are able to do things like devote 18 or 16 weeks to come down to the academy, but then there are older populations who have a higher emotional intelligence base, who have lived experiences and who may be able to interact and de-escalate more. And so, you know, you also want that mix of experience of life experience and police agencies as well. Can these folks who may be single parents come to the academy, come all the way down south and then, then learn? Um, it's, it's difficult and probably not. So, so looking at adults-based learning techniques, looking at um, how do you, uh, if, if there are community colleges or if there are other learning institutions that folks can go through a CJ program, get specific training in, in, in coordination with the academy, what the uh, requirements are, and then do something like an RLTC type of program that every weekend or these different weekends you come down and then you learn you know, the, the other aspect, the hands-on aspect of use of force of firearms training or just that, that personal interaction understanding um, that culture of service and first response. So I think that just that flexibility will also uh, allow for, for more, for a different cadre of officers coming into the field um, that can bring different life experiences. Um, so it's, it's, it's very hopeful, I think, um, in that way, shape or form. And, and then there's also um, looking at um, ACT uh, or like, a, like Team 2. Team 2 is great. Uh, it's, it's, it's working with everything that we can possibly work with, with the resources that are available in the, um, in the state. I personally haven't gone through it yet, but I've spoken to folks here in Washington County Mental Health, Gary Gordon, and, and I think that it's a phenomenal plan, but I would like to take that up personally in Montpelier. We're going to take that up another notch and we're going to bring in actually a CIT program. And once we establish that CIT program, we're going to open it up for all law enforcement agencies, again, in understanding the, the fiscal constraints that we as a state and all agencies are facing, we're going to try to do this for free and just bring in officers. So the more people we can train in crisis intervention and de-escalation, the better I think our entire state will be, especially since that law enforcement officers here have statewide jurisdiction. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm all over the board, uh, but if there are any specific questions, um, I would, would be stand ready to, to answer them. Thank you. I appreciate your um, your touching on a few different parts of the bill. I suspect there will be some questions for you. Um, Jim Harrison has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chief, for joining us this morning. And uh, 
belated welcome to um, our capital. So um, we wish you the best. Um, you talked a little bit about civilian oversight and I'm wondering if you could elaborate um, what might be the appropriate boundaries of civilian oversight. Um, and I ask that in the sense that right now, I assume you were hired by the, and I don't know how Montpelier is set up, I assume you were hired by the Montpelier City Council and they gave you some kind of term, you know, let's say two years. And if they don't like your performance, they two years from now, they'll hire somebody else. Um, but they may not, um, you know, tell you who to hire and fire and, and do other things other than approve your budget. So um, what, what, what more should we be doing in terms of civilian oversight? I think um, well, in, in Montpelier, one of the things that we've um, that we're looking to institute is going to be a strategic planning committee is going to be getting the community involved with the with the issues, especially that have been highlighted recently within the problems of our institution, which there are some uh, there are a lot, um, but we're working proactively for them. But with 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 this with the strategic partnership. Um, that represents especially traditionally marginalized communities. That's going to help the police department in developing um, and adopting policies and programs um, and changing, I think the biggest thing is changing culture. Um, and in and, and that immersion and that knowing that that kind of forces us to get out there and be part of that community because the dangers of law enforcement is one of them is developing that us versus them mentality. And if we force ourselves to get out there into the community and realize that these are the people that we serve, these are the people that we love, and these are the people that we're, 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 we have to, you know, are the guardianship mentality. So I, I think that having that, that partnership will, will bring us all closer together. And then when we're looking at things like we want to increase diversity within our ranks to be, uh, you know, solid representation of our communities. How, do, how are we doing that? Are we still just putting out ads in the newspaper or just on Indeed? Or are we actually partnering with like, for example, Montpelier, the Rainbow uh, Coalition of Central Vermont? Um, and are we asking them and tapping their resources and their membership and saying, hey, is there anybody here in the organization that wants to join the police department? So again, we can have that diverse representation. So I think that with, with having those partnerships and, and, and having these, these groups, it, it just brings about more of an opportunity. But if, if I think one of the essential elements in doing that is each understanding um, the other's point of view. So we need to immerse ourselves and learn more about um, other communities, again, the vulnerable populations, for example, um, the, the unique problems that people who are um, may, may be coming out to their family and if the family doesn't accept it, then what does that look like afterwards? Does that relate to truancy issues? Does that relate to alcoholism and drug use? Does that relate to, you know, running away from home? We need to, when we understand the plights that of what people have been going through in their lives, it's easier for us to, to look at things and not a, not a judicial perspective and putting people in this, the criminal justice system, but finding the resources to get them the help that they need. And in return, we also need to educate the public on what our job is and the dangers that we face. So it's not as simple as one of the biggest things that I hear all the time is when you use force, why can't you just shoot somebody in the arm or the leg? Why do you have to, well, that, it's not that easy. So how do we bring that education and that experience to them so everybody has a very good understanding of what each other should be doing rather than making assumptions of what the other side, other side should be doing? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that explanation. Um, but I'm wondering if, you know, if I, I assume Montpelier doesn't have a police commission, I, I, I may be wrong. Um, but if you did, and you had a community group, um, you could have some of those conversations, uh, which might be helpful to uh, um, both sides understanding your job, and how you need to do it. Um, and their concerns in terms of what they perceive as your interactions. So anyhow, I don't, I don't know the answer to this. I'm just fishing for information. Thank you. No, thank you, sir. 
Hal Colston. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and thank you, Chief, for uh, sharing your thoughts um, about this bill. Um, I want to follow up with Representative Harrison's um, questioning around civilian oversight. So I'm trying to imagine what an interdependent relationship might look like between a civilian oversight board and the elected officials who are, uh, you know, responsible for your agency and your agency's performance. So what could that look like so that there's, a, there's an equal sharing of power? Because it all comes down to power. And if civilians who have a lived experience, whether it's positive or negative with law enforcement, how can their voice have equal weight with the elected officials who are directly uh, responsible for, for, for your performance? I think that, that, um, that there are provisions built into the current system to make sure that does happen. It's just gonna be a matter of whether they're act, in, in my humble opinion, acted upon by the elected officials. That um, if, my, if, if my performance is not up to snuff, if, if it is not satisfactory, then I believe that they're going to make their voices heard through through my boss. So, so we do not, as Representative Harrison had alluded to, Montpelier does not have a police commission um, and that who hired me was the uh, uh, was Bill Frazier, who's our city manager, um, with um, me going through various panels, which included um, several with members of the community. Um, but I think that, that that's baked into the current formula um, if my performance is not up to snuff. So my expectations were laid out by, uh, by Bill of that community involvement. But, I, but in regards to if, if you don't have a system like that that's already set up or if it's you know, more of a traditional way, I, I think that what that should look like is um, that's a that's a very tough question. It's a it's a very legitimate question. I think I, it's something I think our, our our again our institution is is struggling with. But I, I think that that oversight um, it it needs to happen in the way that. So in, in President Obama's, and I'm sorry I'm, if I'm fluctuating here. So, so looking at the six pillars of, of, of uh, 21st century policing, when we talk about legitimacy, legitimacy boils down into we don't have power. And, and it's understanding we as a police department don't have power. And I think that what's going on in the nation right now proves that. No, no society is going to allow you to police them if they don't trust you in the first place, if you're not setting that example. And I think that that call is being heard now more than ever. So if, if you have an agency with a, respectfully, I'm speaking for Brian Pete, with, with dinosaur type concepts that just says, okay, we're gonna maintain an isolational type of thing. And we're the police, we're here to protect you. And, and, and we know how to do it best without getting that input and that buy-in from the public. It's incumbent upon the public to say, we demand a different type of strategy. We demand somebody who's going to be collaborative and who's going to come in here and who's going to speak with us and who's going to do that. So I would say it would be incumbent upon the, that local jurisdiction to say these are the cultures and the values of what we want in our police chief because um, and this is what we want to do and these are part of the conditions in which this person should be should, should come on board. Um, so maybe in pushing for that type of thing, uh, the state can again dangle those carrots and saying, if you adopt this type of, uh, um, you know, we're, we're looking at giving funding in these areas. If you have a department that does have a collaborative um, relationship with its community, and not just saying, oh, we meet and we do coffee with a cop, because that's just a, that's honestly just checking off a box. Um, mm -hmm. We actually have established groups. We actually have, you know, this is how this is their input into the policy. And then those groups that do that, we have those establishments or relationships with part of that grant thing could be it's like, okay, well, I want to see, you know, Pete, you know, you do a talked up a real good game. So you just implemented this real this strategic advisory group in Montpelier. I want that group to issue me a letter saying what your relationship status is like. Then I'll think about giving you state funding. So I, so I think that in, in, in using that carrot type of approach um, will probably um, facilitate that change because it's going to be dangerous mandating 
hey, this a one size solution fits all because what works in Burlington is probably not gonna work in Montpelier. What works in Montpelier probably will definitely not work in, with what's going on, on in, in Barry City. So, uh, I, but I think just finding out what that solution is gonna be and just pushing people to that culture is a good fit. And this is just off the cuff, sir. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yes, sir. All right, next I have Bob Hooper with a question. Uh, good morning. Um, say hello to Tim too, because I'm running out the door. But one of the things that's happening in Burlington is uh, the the push and shove of civilian oversight. Um, and my question is pretty concrete. In both your municipalities, does the civilian oversight extend to the city council? You were hired by a town manager, but the city council actually approve the changes to the police officer's contract on a regular basis? <laughs> As far as the police officer's contract, I think that's negotiated between the police union and the city itself. And city council has input in? I believe that they do. I'd have to talk to Bill Frazier about that one, but I'm pretty sure that Bill's looking at looking at it from the interest of the city uh, and then bringing it back possibly for any feedback from the council as needed. That's my assumption, sir. Okay, thank you. I'll pick up Tim's answer later and I'm out of here for a while. Thank you. Take care, yes, Rob. John Gann. Thank you, and thank you, Chief P, for testifying this morning. Um, I just wanted to focus on Section 10A of S-124 a bit. Um, that's the section that uh, makes a number of recommendations about various policies from models of civilian oversight um, to reporting allegations of um, law enforcement misconduct to access to complaint information, body cameras, um, military equipment. And, and just for, for me, your opinion, what group should be involved in recommending to the General Assembly um, various policies um, so that we have inclusion? I think every group. I think the I think everyone who everyone every stakeholder, but especially specifically those of that those of whatever specific community that that this is going to involve. Um, but I think everyone. Um, should be at the table to discuss. And to me, the problem has been trying to get everyone to, to sit down with each other and instead of playing the, the gotcha games, trying to come up with, with, with real life solutions to everything. There are a lot of good points, I think, that are in this bill. Uh, but I think the danger comes into um, and just making sure that it's flexible enough that allows room for, for whatever specific town or city to implement what's going to be best for them. Um, so I, I think going into the weeds too much would be dangerous, but uh, just keeping it a broad overview as to the culture that you want to establish, that culture of inclusion would be the best bet. Would you be concerned if the Department of Public Safety was dictating all these policies to local law enforcement? I, I'd be I'd be concerned if if it got down into the weeds again. I, I, I'm going to learn what's going to be best and what the expectations are of the people of Montpelier. But I think that it's again, it would be dangerous for them. I'm going to look at, at at the commission to tell me what are best practices. This is what I have. Can you tell me if it's if it meets the culture, if it meets the guidelines, if it meets the spirit of what we're trying to do here in Vermont? But going directly down to when we talk about day-to-day -day operations, there are certain things that I'm going to need the flexibility to do um, that I might not get if I'm getting somebody else's policy that I have to adopt it here. I'm going to be accountable to my people and I'm going to be held to the standard of that's not going to work here. Thank you. Yes. Sir. All right, committee, any other questions for Chief Pete? I hope you can stick around with us for a few minutes um, because I, uh, I expect there may be other uh, folks who have questions for you after we hear from Barry Police Chief Bombardier. So I hope you can hang out with us for a few more minutes. Yes, um, I've got Warren Kitzmiller who would like to say a few words. And Warren, your, your hand is up, but you're okay. There we go. Now I can hear you. I, I'm sorry, I got drawn away. I had a, a Peter knocking on my door for a second there. I don't have a question for you, Chief. I just wanted to recognize that you're there with us and say thank you very much for being here today. 
It's good to see you. Thank you, sir. You as well. Yeah. All right. So, Chief Fombardier, please share with us your perspective on the bill. So, good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, asking me to come or me on this Zoom meeting. Um, there's a lot in here. Um, I, I think Chief Pete hit it, the nail on the head when he said there's a lot in here. But I want to kind of start where Chief Pete left off in the conversation of civilian oversight. Um, we have a new committee here in Barry City. Um, when I first came here, and for folks that don't know me, I've been in law enforcement in Vermont for 40 years now. I was state police for 26 years and change in the last uh, 12 years, yeah, 12 here and one in St. Albans, so 40 years. Um, the, the idea of civilian oversight, um, civilian input, I, I think we have a good model at the state level with SPAC and a mixture of individuals sitting on SPAC to advise the commissioner of public safety. Um, that same model with some tweaking could be done in a regional model. Um, the reality is if you have a three person police department um, and you have 2,400 people in your village or 1,200 people in your village, you're not gonna have the resources to have a robust um, oversight committee. Um, and if it's too small, you're not really going to get the viewpoint uh, of everybody in your community. And more importantly, you're not gonna get the viewpoint from people that visit, et cetera. I mean, a lot of times you go to Vermont and I'm from Vermont, so you go to a Vermont community. And a lot of times if it's a real small area, most everybody's like-minded and you're not getting um, the differences of opinion and input um, that I think you need to take care of everybody who comes to your area. Um, a regional model that was supported financially for at least a, a few positions at the top um, could work in Vermont. It could You could have civilian input from multiple jurisdictions and have the same advisory um, function that SPAC has. I'm very familiar with SPAC. I was the director of internal affairs for the state police and the SPAC model works um, both when it comes to um, police allegations of police misconduct and how the commissioner uh, doles out uh, punishment or corrective action. It also is a good resource for input of how to make changes. Uh, when I first came to Barry, I had a small group of Barry individuals that I trusted to tell me what was going on in the community. And we met quite regularly, but that kind of went by the wayside when a lot of the problems got addressed that I was given input for. So I think there's a need for an advisory committee. Um, I'm terrible at names. I, one, of the, one of the representatives asked about the sharing of power. Um, I don't think that went, went very well. I mean, that the advisory role and the way our uh, things are written now, that's what our thing is, is advisory to the council, but there's mechanisms in council in place at the council level that as Chief Pete mentioned, that if they don't like my performance, they can get rid of me. And they should be listening to their constituents. They should be listening to an advisory council made up of different individuals within our community. Um, I think if you throw a cast a bigger net and you look at a, a regional model, you also help support those smaller departments and those smaller communities that don't have the resources and the people to put such a group together and to really get input from a wide variety of individuals and differences of opinion. So I think um, a model similar to SPAC with a regional approach that was advisory, that could act as a sounding board for the citizens and also for the police chiefs. Um, police chiefs need sounding boards. I have people within the community that I call to say, am I still within the tracks? Or am I going too far one way or the other? I think 
it's something we definitely need. Um, and it's, we don't really have to reinvent the wheel. We have to look what's around and do it differently. I don't think it's a start from scratch type model. Um, when we talk about all the rules and different tweaking in here, um, there needs to be some consistency with major things from department to department so that your expectations when a police officer rolls up, regardless of what they're wearing for a uniform, is the same. But there are other things that we have for policies and procedures here in Barry that Chief Pete might not necessarily need or Berlin might not necessarily need. You know, we have 30 something neighborhood watches here. Um, Berlin doesn't need something like that. So you have to look at the individual communities and you have to kind of cast a larger net, but not try to catch everything down to the micro managing point of things to keep it simple with an overview, hit on the major areas of concerns, the major areas of input, um, and go and go from there. I think there's a model that could be um, useful to municipalities. I've actually drafted one and um, distributed to BACOP, the Vermont Association of Chiefs of Police. So I know that's going to surface here soon. Um, we've talked about resources within the community and um, what's out there and getting people help. Um, because the reality is that's what most of law enforcement is, is about is helping people. Yes, we arrest people. Yes, we give people tickets. But if you looked at the majority of the calls, even people we arrest, we try to get them help. And resource navigation, uh, when I look in central Vermont, there are 60 something resource providers for things that a lot of people take for granted, like a roof over your head, food, financial support, or training, you know, life's net basic needs and navigating those resources is a task and a half. Uh, people get sent in different directions and a lot of people throw their hands up in the air. Um, that's something that's not available to every community and it's a public safety function to make sure people are taken care of. Um, that needs to be more robust with regards to looking at where the duplications of efforts are and making sure that people don't have uh, a rat maze to navigate to get to get the help they need. Um, the same thing with other services involving mental health and substance abuse. People get the help, but it's always not a direct route. And they end up, unfortunately, using the police departments and emergency services as their first avenue to get um, in the system, which we are not supposed to be people's first uh, group of individuals to get services. Looking at the um, well, yeah, looking at the the part about um, alternate approaches to certification for to get to level three. Um, I think if we had had this conversation five years ago, I would have been more resistant to that. Um, but I also hear Chief Pete about the alternate things that if, uh, if done right can get there. And I'm also realizing with the struggles that the Academy is going through now, uh, both with staffing and with COVID restrictions, that there needs to be alternate methods out there to get good qualified certified level three officers. Um, I like the concept that Brian threw out about an ROTC after for the hands-on part, like a two or three week portion to do the hands-on. And I think that's something that the committee should look at supporting. And when I say supporting that also includes um, supporting the academy with regards to making that happen. Data collection, um, data collection, needs to be easier for the officers. I mean, you look at what we require our officers to do and what expertise they're supposed to have. Um, 
anything we can do to make their job easier with regards to that. And also one of my big concerns with the data is duplication of data. So that the information that we are giving out is uh, skewed and it doesn't take into consideration things um, like one, one individual and I'm going back and I think it was 16 or 17. We had one individual in town that got arrested like five times in a month happened to be a person of color, but persons lived here all their life. They're known to every police officer uh, by first name and vice versa. And the person was criminally suspended. That skews the numbers in a community um, like Barry City. So those kind of things, um, multiple tickets on a stop getting, getting counted. Um, our data collection systems need to take those things into account so that we have the best data possible when making decisions, uh, both in how our officers are conducting themselves and what we're gonna do for you know, problem areas, because we also use our data for problem areas, et cetera, not just the race data. So looking at that, um, there needs some be, to be consistency there between the two systems. Uh, in a perfect world, we would have one system statewide. It would be under public safety and all the information would be in one spot and everybody would be doing the same thing uh, rather than picking and choosing. And, and that's where we have a lot of our issues is the, the inconsistencies. And I've worked with both systems, Spillman and Balfour. Um, the dispatching thing, right. <laughs> uh, that is a hot potato, uh, to say the least. Um, again, in a perfect world, I think it would be a public safety function at the state level uh, with regional dispatches. Uh, but we know that um, these conversations have gone on for as long as I've been a police officer. And the smaller communities that are struggling with financial issues and have been getting dispatching for free um, don't really have the money to do that. Conversely, if you're Barry City residents and you're looking at what our dispatch center costs or Montpelier's dispatch center costs, you have citizens saying, well, why don't we get anything from the state for this? Because we're paying for dispatching for other people. So that's a hot potato. Um, I like to see some level a level playing field for everybody. And I'm not sure that um, that that's an argument I want to be in the middle of. <laughs> oh, candidly, I <laughs> agree with you on that. I can identify mm -hmm. with that. Do you have time for a question here? Oh, sure. I got plenty of time. Okay, so Hal Colston has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and and thank you, Chief, for sharing your wisdom and, and your 40 years of service. Uh, I have two questions. Um, you talk about SPAC as a as a very successful model. Um, can you be more specific about why that is? And then my other question is: you mentioned that there was an effort to um, share power in terms of civilian oversight and it didn't work. And I wanted to know why did it not work? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll answer the first one, uh, the first question. So the SPAC model, um, my exposure to SPAC has been ongoing for you know 26 years. Um, I really got to know more of the details of the State Police Advisory Committee. Um, it has a mix of individuals from the community um, that are there for the commissioner and the colonel. Um, they, re they review all the internal affairs investigations. They're presented to them um, at monthly or bi-monthly meetings. I'm not sure what their meeting is now, um, but by the director of internal affairs, they get to ask questions. They get to have input with regards to where this is going um, with regards to discipline. They also act as a sounding board for the commissioner. Um, when you have incidents or 
concerns brought to the department. Um, there's also an ed there's an educational piece there between um, the police and the civilians and the commissioner, and it's a two way street. Um, I can remember incidents of talking to SPAC and having to go through use of force policies and levels of force used, what was acceptable and not acceptable. As it was based to what the impression was versus what actually happened and educating SPAC and having members of SPAC being backing what the decisions are made and having that input um, just, it, it seems to work. And I think on a regional model for SPAC that it could work. Um, there's gonna be some, some tweaking on a regional model. And I think, I think it's got potential. Um, my interaction with SPAC wasn't always, you know, we didn't always agree, um, but everybody was respectful. Everybody took input and it helped the commissioner and the colonels make their decisions on how they were gonna do things, whether it was a new policy and procedure, whether it was a new special team, was it, whether it was discipline. Um, and I think that outside input from outside the department is a positive thing. With regards to, I don't think I said there was an incident. I think I said, I can see some pressures with an elected official group and an over, uh, advisory committee or oversight committee bumping heads. Um, I've already seen the conversations being going that, well, the rules say you're advisory only. You can call yourself what you want, but the rules say you're advisory only. So I've already seen that going on just in conversations here. So I imagine that's going to happen, would happen in other places. And there's a recourse for people if they don't like what their city officials do particularly if they don't like what their council members do or the manager or the police chief. You fire the manager or the police chief and you don't elect that person next time around. Um, so I think there's, there's avenues to deal with that. Thank you. All right, I don't see any other committee members with questions. Were there any other aspects of the bill that you wanted to share your thoughts with us on? Um, just let me look here real quick. More, more of a, a comment, uh, the issue of cameras. I personally think body cameras are a great thing. They are also an expensive thing. And we have, uh, we have some serious limitations with regards to when and where we can't use them. Um, we need, we, we being as a state need to find good hard rules with things like storage, where we're gonna get the money for them, access to storage, et cetera. Um, we had cameras in the cruisers here and they died to replace them was tens of thousands of dollars. And they really weren't where my officers needed video. Our officers here in Barry city, their interaction with individuals is mostly in people's houses where you can get told to shut your cameras off. And, um, that creates a problem. And they're not, the, they're not the end all answer to everything, but they are another tool and another valuable resource. Questions from committee members? All right, so Chief Pete, I wanted to just come back to you and see if the, um, if this conversation or any of the questions have sparked any more thoughts. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so very, very much. There are just three, and I'll just be brief. Um, uh, in regards to uh, uh, in, in Section 10, again, I believe 
that uh, there's a line that says, after consulting with the Secretary of State, the Human Rights Commission, the American Civil Liberties Union, and other interesting parties, I think that's a, that's a great start because that does talk about that inclusivity, about who should have that seat at the table. But I think one of the other mandates that should, especially when, when talking about requests for body-worn camera footage and recommendations for timelines, I think that it should probably be um, also the state's attorneys included in that because they're going to see, it's not just gonna be like, for example, if there is misconduct or a lawsuit that stems from uh, an officer's performance or behavior, it's also going to be, uh, the state's attorneys are going to also have a, a very good idea on what they've seen in law about how long footage should be retained. Um, also the, um, I, I did have a concern and personally coming here to Vermont, I've, I've been through the, uh, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, uh, the Chicago Police Academy within the state, and then I also had certification in New Mexico. Uh, but when I came here, pretty much every bit of training that I had is, I have to have to go through an even more lengthy um, certification by waiver process. So I think that there's difficulty in attracting officers who may want to come to this beautiful state. And, but the process is, is kind of convoluted and it doesn't take into consideration um, the experiences or other additional trainings that the uh, that other officers may have. So it's, it's much more difficult. Like I have to have 20, 120 hours of training of, of on the job training from somebody who I've more than likely been in law enforcement, you know, twice the time they have and they're going to teach me about traffic stops and everything. So I get it. I, I, I get, you know, we, we got to do things the way that's, you know, that the state requires us to do. But I think there needs to be more flexibility into what carries over for certification. Uh, and then the last thing is, um, um, and looking at, um, I would think you may want to look at language that talks about early warning systems as well. So when you're, I, I think the spirit of what some of this is talking about with data collections, when you're looking at things like road stops, when you're looking to say, okay, which officers have stopped people of color, and if if we're seeing officers who are having a, a combination of complaints, a combination of, you know, this is the same officer that's giving, you know, when they're stopping somebody of color, they're giving eight tickets instead of when they're stopping somebody else, they're giving one. So these types of early warning systems, these, um, those are things that can be, um, you know, I, I think that when you talk about a regionalized effort and gathering that those data system points, you probably want to hit on early warning systems and you would probably talk to the commissioner because um, I think Mike Schilling has probably has a very good grasp of what's going to, what are the indicators that you're looking for. And so it's not just data. It's not, a, to me, it's, we're, we're taking one foot, one step forward saying we want collection data on traffic stops and, 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 and what the, uh, you know, who we're stopping, people of color and everything. But I think the next step is finding out, you know, specifically what are the trends in these traffic stops and then using those towards early warning systems because that also goes towards the sixth pillar of policing, 21st century policing is officer wellness. Uh, if, if we're seeing things that, you know, if, if performance is plummeting um, at work and, and they're having problems at home, that's gonna translate in, in the other areas. So these early warning systems also, it helps you identify the bad actors who nobody wants, but it also helps you identify the people who are crying for help. So with, with everything that's in this bill, I would also um, beg, um, from a personal standpoint, I would beg you to put something in here that talks about what we're gonna do for officer wellness and officer, and officer health. Um, that that's, I think is, is crucial because we're, we're getting hammered um, and, and we're dealing with the sins of our, of our profession. No doubt about it, there, there have been sins. Um, but there are some people who are struggling in this career that also need your help. And they need the ability to get counseling. They need the ability for advanced EAP. They need check well-being checks. They need everything because if you can help them get their home life and their personal life in order, you're gonna have a, an officer or a trooper that's going to come out there and they're, they're going to bust their butts for the citizenry. So uh, I would implore you to also look at something like that as well. So thank you so much. So I appreciate you bringing that up because that has been um, sort of a consistent nagging worry in, in my heart as we've been talking about um, police reform and particularly as we've been talking about uh, the details of some of the instances of use of force that um, you know, it just cries out to me that 
uh, untreated um, PTSD could could very well um, result in somebody having an outsized reaction to uh, to a threat um, that that might actually cause an escalation of uh, of use of force um, instead of a de-escalation. And um, so, you know, Vermont was one of the first states to pass um, uh, a mandate that uh, PTSD coverage be uh, be included explicitly in uh, in workers' comp coverage. I understand from conversations that I've had with some folks who have tried to access PTSD coverage, um, not in the law enforcement community, but in the, in the uh, fire community, that uh, they have found it really difficult to, to actually get coverage for the counseling that they need to help them work through their trauma. And, um, and that's very disturbing. And, and hopefully we can get to the bottom of uh, of where those barriers are, because when the legislature passed this bill two years ago, uh, we intended very clearly that there would be um, there would be a presumption of it being work related, um, and so that that officer or that um, uh, firefighter or that EMS person could get the coverage they or the counseling they need. And ma'am, thank you so very much. I was really proud when I saw that back in Chicago. Um, if I also may touch that, again, the, the dispatchers as well and mm -hmm. um, are dealing with that. And, and one of part, of part of, since we're talking about police culture, one of the things that literally kills us within our culture is, is that, that officers are afraid. They think that if, if I come up and I say, I'm, I'm having problems, I lose my gun, I lose my job. And that's forcing people to come through. And, and, if, and, if, and again, like if, as we're looking at laws and policies to, to push our culture change in our profession, I think that part of that should be making sure that police leaders like myself take care of the people we're charged to oversee. And, and so that when, we, when, when there are fitness for duties, um, uh, when we do fitness for duty assessments or when someone comes forward of their own accord that we have protections for that person to get better um because because everybody in our career field is pretty much operating with ptsd so we can do this job correctly but nobody should be afraid to think that if i say if i have a weakness that i'm i'm going through something then i'm going to lose my job for it that just makes things worse for everybody and then then the um the the second part of that one uh, again, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, but the second, the, the other thing I would also encourage is when we're talking about um, the duty to report and duty to intervene, that we also put in whistleblower protections, um, that the state protects those people because, uh, again, uh, again, in, in organizations, I haven't seen it since I've been here, but I've only been here a little a short amount of time, but there are cultures that are going to be out there that if I say something, I'm gonna get ostracized by my career. I've seen it in Chicago, I've seen it in other places that if I report that person, I mean, look at Minneapolis. You know, people are afraid that if, if I do something, if say something about somebody who has seniority, so what are their protections as well? So I think that the state should also consider um, whistleblower protections um, that, that will protect people who do come forward uh, internally as well. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, so when you started talking about early warning um, systems, I saw Chief Bombardier nod his head. Um, and so that tells me that A, he's, he's um, identifying with that, but, but, um, but B, the, con the, the, the title early warning systems doesn't really mean anything to me. So Chief Bombardier, if you would help us with a little context on what an early warning system is. I mean, that sounds to me like a, uh, for weather phenomena, but tell me how it applies to law enforcement. So, and I kind of got off on a tangent when we were talking about SPAC and community oversight, and I forgot one of the other portions of uh, what I've been talking to the Chiefs Association about with the Regionalized Oversight Advisory Committee and regionalized internal inve internal investigations within police departments. Um, 
early warning systems as they're connected to that. Uh, guardian tracking is what the state police are using to track that. It tracks complaints against officers. There's some built-in um, key components that if Officer Smith or Officer Jones keeps getting these little, what would end up being miscellaneous complaints, um, you know, after X miscellaneous complaints, it generates a warning that something else may be going on. It may not, but it might be, and, and it gives the administration and supervisors um, a chance to look at what's, what, if any, are underlying things that are causing these miscellaneous complaints. Um, we talked about SPAC model regionally, but also one of the things and that um, smaller departments have suffered from, in my opinion, um, in Vermont is when complaints do come in, how they get investigated. Um, criminal complaints have always been investigated by outside agencies. Most of the time, state police detectives from another area of the state. But investigations in-house when you're a five-person police department get put people on edge after a while. Sergeant Jones can only investigate patrol officer Smith five or six times before there's some built-in tension there. And along with a, an oversight, a regional approach to oversight or advisory, civilian advisory component would also be a regionalized internal affairs investigation component with um, trained investigators. And they don't have to be detectives, usually more senior officers that have good invest investigative skills from the different agencies in the region with the supervisor over them and then a director over that who would be present. And the director and the supervisors along with the chiefs of any municipality would be um, going to the advisory committee and going over all the internals so that you had that extra layer outside look at things. Um, I've got a draft written up. I've actually given it to Commissioner Shirling and the Chiefs Association of a type of oversight and internal investigations based on a regional model involving all municipalities with larger ones having the ability to opt out. So if you've got a hundred person police department, you probably can do your own internals and you probably want to, but they would have to demonstrate that they had the same model or same capabilities as the regional model. So that early warning system, um, if, if your department that's got um, the resources and you have your own internal affairs thing and it's one person in Vermont, the departments are small enough so that when I was director of state police, if I kept getting multiple complaints on a, on a trooper, I would know right off. Same here. If I get multiple complaints on an officer back to back, I'm going to check on is there an underlying problem here? Is something else going on? But when you talk about tiny departments' abilities to do um, their investigations, et cetera, I think the more robust of a program you can put together and pooling resources is going to be a better thing. So the early warning is just a way of tracking uh, incidents and giving command staff and supervisors a heads up that something may or may not be going on. Excellent. Thank you. Um, committee, any questions for either chief? All right. Um, we have uh, Gwen Zakoff from the League of Cities and Towns with us this morning and um, would love to invite you, Gwen, to, to share your thoughts with us today. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. Um, if there's a dog barking in the back, I apologize. It's trash day, so <laughs> whenever they roll up, it gets a little loud. Um, so I am asked to come back to the committee because um, uh, I was listening to testimony from yesterday and felt it was um, probably important that um, VLCT um, poke their head in back into the bill and um, 
put a few things on, on record. Um, and I'm actually glad that I um, got to sit through the testimony from um, both chiefs because um, I, I uh, pretty much 100% of what they said in their testimony aligns with um, VLT, VLCT's policy positions um, uh, moving forward. Maybe one that is still of question, not necessarily of support or um, of opposition is a regional model for um, civilian oversight um, or review. Um, we haven't gotten down to that level of detail um, as as a, as a league to um, determine what the proper uh, proper model would be. Um, but any regional model um, would certainly have to have a heavy um, component of localized um, input. Um, so just wanted to point that out. But pretty much everything else that. Um, both chiefs uh, said in their testimony, uh, we 100% align with. Um, I did want to point out, uh, there's three things I wanted to bring up. I had already talked about the dispatch issue, um, how we really cannot um, you know, get involved with it because we represent all municipalities. Obviously the cost is an issue, the timing is an issue, but I've already gone on record with saying that. So that's, um, uh, that's not what I wanted to talk about today. Um, I believe the committee had asked that the LCT weigh in on the um, municipal public safety plans that are towards the very end of the bill, where um, the legislature would like uh, municipalities, all municipalities under their local emergency management plans to um, look into their uh, public safety plans in general um, and what, uh, what they have in place. Um, initially, from what I recall, this was going to be put into the town plan, which obviously doesn't make any sense because the town plan has to do with actual, you know, zoning and bylaws and development and those sorts of things. So it, 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 in terms of where it's housed, it makes sense to be under the local emergency management plan. Um, I would argue that this is already being done, perhaps not pen to paper, although it is being done pen to paper in, in many communities, um, you know, communities tend to know what they have, um, how they provide fire um, service, um, where they get their um, EMS uh, from, and um, those that have either contracts or have their own um, departments um, know where their law enforcement is um, coming from. So we, had, we are pretty agnostic about this. We think it's fine in there. Um, and it, it certainly cannot hurt for towns to um, also look into their overall public safety management structure. <clears throat> and there was another component in there about how the um, LEAB would look into how law enforcement or how um, towns and cities can increase law access to law enforcement. Um, similar to what I just said, I think towns are pretty much know how they can go about getting law enforcement access and uh, thread through um, the testimony from um, both chiefs is that it, it comes down to uh, money and resources. So, um, and it also comes down to the, the will of the public and what they would like to have in their you know community. Where I live, we have a, a contract um, with the local sheriff's department um, for X amount of hours um, with a you know structure of what sort of services our community is looking for. Um, and it's going to change from community to community. Um, and so access really comes down to, I think we already know the answer to that question, um, was, is, is what they can get from their property tax in order to pay for those services and what the community asks for at town meeting in March every year in terms of what, um, what sort of law enforcement they um, want for their communities. Um, so into the, 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 what I really wanted to talk about, though, was... Um, VLCT's, uh, VLCT having seats at the table um, at the, um, particularly within the Vermont, Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. Um, VLCT does not have a seat currently um, on the Training Council. Um, uh, apparently, at, at some point, there used to be public seats, and um, we had a seat at the table, but um, in, at least in the last four years or so, we have not, maybe five, but I can't remember exactly how far back it goes now. Um, <clears throat> I think that it's really important, you know, a, a thread through what um, the committee has talked about, um, certainly Vermont has talked about, um, is that the training, the training of our law enforcement um, officers is, is, is where the rubber meets the road. Um, our municipalities get what the academy puts out. 
uh, our, 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 our town managers, our select boards, even our citizens, they have absolutely no say in um, what kind of training um, is required and what is uh, wanted and what makes sense for their communities. And so um, all of the trust is put within the system itself. And so as uh, public officials, as um, you know, representatives of VLCT representing those public officials that uh, are utilizing the academy, and as employers, um, especially those towns that have uh, local departments, as employers um, who are now getting employees that are coming out of this system, um, they want to ensure that they're getting um, the best uh, best officers they can that um, are representing the um, the wants and needs of their community, and so um, it doesn't have to be VLCT. Although it's you're hard pressed to find another organization in the state that does represent municipalities. I don't. I think we're the only one. Um, pretty sure. Um, so it unfortunately or fortunately, we're sort of put into that middleman position where um, you know you obviously you can have a you know a, a town manager, a select board member play that role, but there is that bias initially if you just have one representative from one community serving that role. So VLCT can sort of act as that um, again middle person um, to not only um, oversee but uh, have it all, another unique res uh, perspective where you know we do provide um, not VLCT the, the the main league but our trust the two trust that we manage um, for all of our municipalities is we're always looking to reduce risk and to make sure that um, things are done um, that. Um, will not put our municipalities in um, a, li a, a greater liability exposure. Um, so that is also another um, aspect of it. Um, the other, the last point I wanted to make goes back to the civilian um, citizen oversight boards that are contemplated in the bill. It doesn't, what's written in the, in, in, in the bill is just a sort of a study. So there's no real um, structure or specifics to it. So um, it's hard to say where that would lead to, but having, I'll, I'll speak just to VLCT having a seat, at least in having say in that, it harkens back to what I just said about having a seat at the board for the Criminal Justice Training Council is that, you know, the VLCT can represent municipal interest um, as, you know, they're looking over citizen oversight proposals that are being created. I think it's, oh, it's really important to remember that there are governance structures that are in place under the most basic of municipal laws out there, um, that there are very few people um, that really are understand municipal law and are, are aware of the nuances of it, um, unless they either work in municipal law or they work alongside municipalities. Um, so if oversight over law enforcement is put in the hands of non-municipal officers and, and officials and employees, um, we believe that it not only would force municipalities to break current municipal laws that are in place, but also potentially um, expose um, our towns to greater liability exposure by breaking employment laws that are on the books and potentially violating labor contracts that are already in place. Um, and again, this would put our taxpayers um, and our citizens that we're representing in a huge financial risk um, and increased liability exposure through um, potential lawsuits. So um, the position from the Vermont League of Cities and, uh, and Towns Board of Directors recently, and I, I submitted this as, uh, as testimony today, um, outlines, and it, it goes beyond just the scope of S-124, but um, one provision that they do uh, speak to is the civilian oversight boards. And there has to be a recognition that there are um, structures in place that um, when you're talking about actual oversight rather than input, there you're creating um, a, an environment where I, all you really have to do is look up um, I-89 towards Burlington and see what's going on right now to see that um, <clears throat> they're, they're at a standstill. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, because the um, certain citizens in the in the in the city are looking for a change that, legally speaking, um, cannot be changed. Um, so there, these these things need to get worked out in terms of you know who has control, what control do they have, what authority do they have, what um, uh, what say do they have, and have really clear lines and delineations of um, of of what. Um, roles people play, and it won't be clean, and it won't be easy, 
And um, I, I've looked to other models in other states um, just trying to find some information. And yes, there are citizen um, in, uh, oversight or advisory uh, panels and committees and commissions that are put forth, but they're done at a scale that actually is a bigger than the entire state of Vermont. Um, I, I would challenge anyone to find any model that even does it at a um, size of Vermont model, um, let alone something where you're talking about a, um, uh, a town or county um, uh, population model that we have in, in Vermont. So um, I, I think that's pretty much the gist of what I wanted to say. The bill it has a ton of other stuff in it that we either support or pretty or agnostic to. There's nothing really that we object to. Um, but I felt the need to, um, I guess, defend the, the, the reasons for having VLCT, VLCT in a room on, on many of these decisions because there is, we are uniquely situated to represent municipalities that otherwise, if we were not in the room, towns just would not have any um, input or say or any, um, or a talking head in the room to, um, to say their, uh, say what they need to say. Um, and I will say that um, it has nothing to do with the bill, but because um, M Madam Chair, you brought it up about the PTSD um, uh, and uh, that PTSD issue. If that, if your committee wants to take this up now, next year, whatever, I really highly encourage you to talk to um, Joe Damiata. He runs our property and casualty intermunicipal trust. It's the trust that all of our towns, you know, created to support our um support their towns through um, property casualty and um, Brookman con claims. So he would be the person you'd want to talk to about those sorts of things. So I just, I nodded that, I've noted that in my notes and wanted to bring that up before um, I ended. So that's all I needed to say. Thank you. I expect that we will uh, have some conversations beginning in January about how PTSD coverage is working. Um, I will share that name with the Committee of Jurisdiction. Uh, John Gannon. Thank you. Um, and thank you for testifying, Gwen. Um, it, just a question about putting the VLCT on the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. I, I mean, my concern with that is, uh, you know, you won't take a position on dispatch fees um, because some of your towns are going to be treated differently. I could see that issue coming up time and time again. Some police departments may mm -hmm. have body cameras and want, think they're a great idea. Other towns, police departments may think it's not such a good idea because of the expense. Sure. Um, so are, are, I mean, where are you going to be able to provide input if you have towns that are in different places with respect to these policies? Well, I think there's a difference between having a yes, no position and having um, insight into getting to a, a solution that an entire board where there's you're just one voting member of to come to some final de determination on, on things. So, yeah, we might not have a yes, no position on some things, but we certainly um, understand the nuances of both sides. Like if you're using dispatch as the example, you certainly understand why it's a problem and why certain communities feel a certain way. And they're not wrong or right on either side. They're actually both right and wrong. So um, that input is, is more about understanding the, the, the structures of the local government, the, the laws that are in place. Um, there, again, you know, there are not a lot of folks that really understand the nuances of, of municipal law outside. I mean, there are, but, you know, having it under one umbrella or one group VLCT just seems like the most natural fit. Um, so uh, I think the, the dispatch issue is, is unique. We, we've had positions on, on this before. I think it's, this is a recent, um, uh, a, a recent move from the league to not take a position because really the numbers are so evenly split. And we've been, as um, Chief Bardier said, this issue has been alive before I've been alive. Um, it's actually been alive 10 years more than I've been alive. For 50 years, the state has, um, I've, read the, I've read the reports that has been dealing with dispatch. And I think to a degree, the ball is in the legislature and the state's court to make that final determination. It shouldn't be left up to the League of Cities and Towns to um, to to make the determination about um, how dispatch is, is is modeled. It needs to be done by um, the state at this point. So, um, but things like body cameras, on the other hand, we are 
we have not heard any opposition from our communities about body cameras. We've heard much more support about wanting to have body cameras. But there's also the issue of public access, um, having um, folks in the room who um, can talk about public records, can talk about the legal you know, implica implications of the exemptions that are in place, talk about how much money it's going to cost to house individuals into each law enforcement department to do the redactions that are needed to provide that information, the cost of, um, you know, obviously the cameras and data storage, which thankfully is the, the cost of those things are going down. But um, you, we, our position, I guess there's more of a position on that than there would be dispatch, but um, it's more the input you can put on uh, into it rather than a, a, a yes, a yay or nay or an up and down vote. Well, but you didn't really help on the dispatch issue of putting any data there. I mean, there's definitely costs to towns with respect to that. And I mean, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why the timing of, of, of if, if the state, because the state, again, the state already has the ability to do this, right? So they could do this tomorrow if they wanted to. Um, that there's an understanding that the towns are going to get a big bill again, uh, whether it's put out in a few year, two, three, four years, whether it's done in a tiered model. Um, there's going to be there's going to be needed uh, there's going to be time needed for um, towns to adjust their budgets and figure out what programs they're going to cut, um, what things are going to be um, put out on their capital you know manage their capital plan where they can't uh, do certain repairs because now they're going to have to pay pay the bill. Um, but then the flip side of that, that there's already towns that have been paying that bill. So um, some towns want it to be done tomorrow um, or yesterday, and other towns um, are, are, are wanting um, a lot more time to um, adapt to uh, having to pay for that huge bill now. So um, I don't know if that helps, but, you know, it's, it's hard when you're put in a position where you're you're, you can put input about why people are upset or why change might be needed, but without having to take, this is our, our, our position on it. And I, I think that dispatch is probably one of the only um, issues that we don't, that we just recently don't have a, 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 have a strong up or down uh, position on. Pretty much everything else we have outlined in our policy or have guidance from our board of directors from. Okay, thank you. Mr. Vice Chair, I think you're up. <laughs> I, I think you're right. Um, oh, there, Sarah. My apologies. John, are you done with questions so we can jump to Jim? Yes, I am. Thank you. Go ahead, Jim. OK, thank you. Um, just a slightly different perspective, I would hope. First. Well, the dispatch fees really, I don't think, are a purview of the Criminal Justice Training Council. I don't think that's why we have set up that structure. It's, um, but secondly, I would hope um, that the Training Council is reaching consensus on various things they need to make decisions on, not yes or up or down votes. Um, and and I, I just a caution, as we expand the size of these groups, um, there is a potential for more up and down votes. And sometimes it can be harder to reach consensus. Select boards tend to be three, five, seven members. Um, and, and there's some advantages to a small group because you can work through issues and reach consensus. When you have groups of 20, it's harder, um, you know, and, and, and I'm not doing this to pick on Burlington, but Burlington has a larger city council because it's a larger city and you get more up and down divided votes. Um, so I just, 
a caution. I, I do like trying to figure out ways we get consensus and broader buy-in um, in an important area like the Criminal Justice Training Council. Just my, my two cents this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, committee members, any questions from, uh, from you all for any of our witnesses today? John Gannon. Um, thank you. Um, another question for Gwen. Um, Gwen, have you had an opportunity to look at the executive order um, 03? Yes. Um, yes. Does FCC have a position on that? Um, we, so our, um, uh, we, our board hasn't met. We're having another meeting. So the, so the answer is no, but I think um, the testimony that I put forward outlines the, um, the board's position already. So I think that I, generally speaking, there's alignment um, and support. Um, I think the very last provision, I don't have it in front of me, unfortunately, but I think there was a last provision about the sort of regional oversight models. I think that that was sort of questionable. Um, but um, we we haven't had made, we haven't had time to put a formal position on um, on that. But if you align our board position with the governor's executive order, you'll see um, general alignment to them. Not entire, but general. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions from committee members? All right. Um, so, uh, Chiefs and Gwen, you are welcome to hang out with us for the remainder of the meeting if you'd like to. Um, I think what I'd like to do now is ask Betsy Ann if she can uh, help the committee understand more about the State Police Advisory Council and its duties and makeup, um, since that was mentioned kind of specifically as a, a model for how you might regionalize oversight. Sure. Hello. Uh, for the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. And Madam Chair, if it's okay, I think it would also help to just kind of back up and look at the uh, duty of SPAC and all other law enforcement agencies generally. Um, and um, if it's all right, I would like to share screen and we can just do a high level overview of what the current requirements are in regard to investigation and uh, civilian oversight, if that's okay. Go right ahead. I, just got, I got the notice that my internet's unstable. So just let me know if I am uh, starting to slow down here. So what I'm sharing, are you able to see the screen okay? Yep, we can see it. Okay. So big picture, the way that law enforcement oversight is set up is that Every agency, for the most part, is responsible for conducting its own investigations of alleged officer misconduct. And there are two effects of this. Um, the overall, the results are potential discipline that could be imposed by the agency itself on the agency's officer. And then, uh, reporting of alleged officer unprofessional conduct to the council as the council is the state's overall entity that they has the authority to discipline an officer certification. So while an agency itself could impose discipline on an officer that would affect the officer's ability to practice at that agency, the council has the authority to discipline an officer's certification, which impacts the ability of the officer to practice anywhere in the state. As part, and this is what I'm pulling up here, is the requirement for all agencies to investigate allegations of officer misconduct in the council's criminal justice training council. And this applies to uh, all complaints, um, uh, unless the complaint is in regard to the officer's executive officer, the highest ranking officer. In that case, statute prohibits 
um, an agency from investigating its own executive officer. But as I understand it, and I think has been discussed, agencies also um, can have a, an investigation conducted by another agency, particularly if there's an allegation of a crime that's been committed. As part of this duty to have each agency uh, investigate allegations of misconduct uh, of its own officers, the council chapter requires each agency to adopt an effective internal affairs program. And so this ensures fairness in the investigation or it's designed to and uniformity in um, discipline that may be imposed by an agency. There's a definition of an effective internal affairs program that I'll get to in a second, but there is here in 20 VSA 2402B, there's also the requirement for the council to create a model policy for an effective internal affairs program. The definition of an effective, effective internal affairs program is defined in the council chapter as having specific elements. It's that they accept complaints about their officers. Um, they investigate them. They assign an investigator to determine whether an officer violated policy or state law. There's policies about how an officer, what the duties um, ex expected of the officer are and what the discipline that could be imposed. There's fairness and discipline. And here's that language, civilian review. As part of any effective internal affairs program, an agency has to have civilian review. Um, and the language is that it provides for review of an officer disciplined by civilians, but then it says, which may be a select board or other elected or appointed body, at least for the conduct to be required to be reported to the council. And the Vermont State Police has its SPAC, the State Police Advisory Commission. And that's that this has existed um, before these council requirements ever came into law. SPAC has existed for a while. Um, SPAC is set forth in DPS's statutes. It's 20 VSA 1922. SPAC has uh, seven members that are appointed by the governor. At least one has to be an attorney and one has to be a retired state police officer. They're appointed by the governor with the advice and consent of the Senate. They have four year terms. The governor appoints the chair. And the overall duty of SPAC is to provide advice and counsel to the commissioner in carrying out the commissioner's responsibilities for managing, supervising, and controlling the VSP. And specifically, uh, the language provides that to ensure state police officers are subject to fair and known practices, SPAC is required to advise the commissioner of public safety in regard to uh, reviewing rules and uh, yes, with respect to and reviewing rules concerning promotions, grievances, transfers, internal investigations, and discipline. The next section, 20 VSA 1923, talks about how VSP uh, investigates complaints against its own officers. And SPAC has a role in the investigation of VSP investigating its own officers. The statute provides that SPAC is to advise and assist the commissioner of DPS in developing and making known routine procedures to ensure that allegations of misconduct by state police officers are investigated fully and fairly, and that appropriate action is taken in regard to those allegations. And specifically, the commissioner of DPS has to ensure that those procedures constitute that effective internal affairs program in the council chapter. And SPAC, as I understand it, helps uh, is part of that civilian review that's required of an uh, effective internal affairs program. How VSP structures its investigations, its internal investigations of allegations of misconduct against its own officers is that VSP has an office of internal investigation within DPS and that is required to investigate all allegations of conduct by members of DPS 
unless it's a complaint against a member of the Office of Internal Investigation itself, and then that gets handled separately. So the head of VSP's Office of Internal Investigation reports all allegations and the office's findings on those allegations to the commissioner DPS. They also have to get reported to the state's attorney and the AG and the governor, unless it doesn't include um, an allegation that a crime was committed. And then also the disposition of all those cr criminal allegations. So VSP's Office of Internal Investigation has to maintain a log of uh, all allegations of misconduct. It also has to document all actions taken with respect to each allegation, including a notation of the people who were assigned to investigate, all the documents, all the actions taken in the final disposition. And if there's a failure to of any member of DPS to report to the Office of Internal Investigation an allegation of misconduct known um, to the member that could be grounds for disciplinary action. So here's where VS, uh, the SPAC seems to play a large role. It says that these records of Office of Internal Investigation are confidential, except SPAC at any time is entitled to have full and free access to those records of VSP's own investigation of officers. Um, and the director of the state police um, at, or SPAC has to report to the council um, according to the reporting requirements for reporting allegations of misconduct to the council. And also SPAC, even though otherwise uh, investigation, investigative records of VSP officers are to remain confidential. This last paragraph says that SPAC, in its discretion, is entitled to report to authorities it deems appropriate or to the public or both to ensure that proper action is taken. So if SPAC, by this language, feels that the Department of Public Safety is not adequately addressing um, an allegation of officer misconduct, SPAC at least does have that authority to publicize that information if it feels appropriate. So it still is advisory though. Um, it, it, it's not a control. It, the duty as I read this is that the commissioner of DPS still has to um, maintain the control over the VSP, but this SPAC entity is to give advice um, and it is, it is tasked with accountability and that um, ensuring accountability so that if it, SPAC does not believe that um, appropriate action was taken, it could be made public. Then I'll just note once again that whatever the result of an agency's investigation is, the agency itself could discipline its officer, but then the role of the council is to ensure that officers throughout the state are maintaining professional conduct. And so the council chapter defines what constitutes unprofessional conduct and the role of the council overall is to um, discipline an officer's certification if the council believes that, and finds that an officer committed unprofessional conduct and any discipline that it imposes would be discipline that follows that officer certification wherever the officer practices in this state. So you're having this one conversation about what role civilians should play um, or the public should play um, in regard to a discipline that an individual agency might impose on an officer. But there's also that role that the council has in maintaining those standards um, statewide and through the authority that it has over an officer's certification. And this bill does include the public or at, changes the membership of the council to include um, members of the public to play in that role. So um, with respect to whistleblower protection, um, 
is there any explicit currently explicit protection for folks within an agency that may make an allegation? Not that I am aware of other than this language in um, specifically for VSP and the internal investigation statute that requires requires officers to report allegations of misconduct. But unless I'm overlooking something, I, I don't, um, I'm not aware of any whistleblower protection outside of this. Okay. Jim Harrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Betsy Ann, thank you for that overview. Um, just a, a couple of quick questions. Um, if I understood you correctly in regards to the state police advisory uh, council, that the state police could do an investigation find no wrongdoing, but they report this to this advisory group and the advisory group could choose to make it public. Is that correct? You're, you're muted. Uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, that language in 20 VSA 1923 about internal investigations um, provides in subsection D, that's SPAC, is entitled at any time to have full and free access to investigative records, and then has the discretion um, to report um, to any authorities or the public um, as it determines uh, deems necessary to ensure that proper action is taken. Um, so it doesn't say it doesn't say specifically that SPAC can just release all of those public records, but it does seem to indicate to me. Um, that it has at least an authority to, for example, state that VSP received, uh, I'm just making a hypothetical, that VSP received a, uh, a report of egregious conduct and that the uh, VSP failed to take action to respond to that conduct. So um, it, I, I just wanna compare it to um, our own ethics committee. Um, if one of us has a violation um, charged, um, my understanding, our ethics committee, it, it's totally confidential unless and when, until when the um, charge is concluded that it's, um, you're guilty um, of some. So is that, there's no one that can release that information there's no secondary uh, group or committee that says, you know, uh, Jim Harrison was charged with X, Y, Z, uh, and that's released un until I'm found guilty. Is that correct? Are you talking about the House Ethics? Yeah. Own provisions? Um, yes, by the House Ethics Panel Procedure, um, the panel and Ledge Council, which staffs the panel, are required to keep confidential any info that it receives in accordance with the procedure to um, receive um, and investigate complaints. But if pursuant to that procedure, what would happen in practice is that um, if the panel did think it was appropriate to um, discipline a house member, what would likely happen in practice is that there would be a resolution for the house's consideration, um, which is when that allegation um, would be made public and that would be for the house to determine. I'll also note that there's nothing stopping anyone else, um, for example, the complainant from making his or her uh, okay. complaint public against a house member. There's no limit on a person, not only filing a complaint with the house ethics panel, but also publicizing the fact that they made that complaint. Okay. Okay, no, that's okay. That, that, I just wanna make sure we're not doing something separate for ourselves that we're requiring holding others to a, a different standard. My, my last question is relation to union contracts. Um, how does this all relate? Usually union contracts have a specified procedure for disciplinary action. And um, you know we've, we've heard recently some things in Burlington where some people are demanding um, you know, action against uh, some police officers. 
and the city is saying, look, we followed our disciplinary guidelines um, and we can't uh, do that. So uh, how does this all relate? I think part of, so I'm, I'm not as familiar with the Burlington's charter because Burlington has a charter that provides special law that governs the city. Um, and so the law always controls but the law allows for contracts. Looking at municipal law generally, um, the language about a municipality being able to discipline its officer is set forth in 24 VSA 1932. And that provides for um, a hearing before the legislative body of a town in regard to officer misconduct. And there is um, the authority for the, um, after a hearing and charges um, that um, there would have to be cause that was found. And so what, I, I, what I'm not as familiar with though is what are in those contracts. It's just not what I would normally deal with. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure it would be helpful to see what a sample uh, labor contract is for officers to see what it contains. I mean, all the, um, any, anything that's in a contract has to be in accordance with statutory law that could govern what could be in there. Um, but and, and maybe we could hear from our labor attorney in Ledge Council too, if that would be helpful to talk more about what could potentially be in a contract that an officer has. Um, but it, it, a contract could include terms of employment and how an officer's, um, the disciplinary process for an officer. I just don't have enough inf um, knowledge of the specifics of those contracts to tell what they yeah, normally and, and and i don't know what the right answer is i appreciate your insight i just i i think we're all served better by a system of checks and balances and civilian oversight can be part of that checks and balances but i'm also cognizant that um, when publicly we make deals uh and contract negotiations that um, we, we have a responsibility to protect those um, contract uh, provisions and be fair to the employee. So um, I, I don't know what the right balance is here, but I sort of like just fishing for more information. Thank you. All right, any other committee members? with questions. All right, Betsy Ann, anything else you have for us? Uh, not, at, not specifically at this moment. Um, Thank you for, uh, for, yeah. for being <laughs> so um, flexible and and quick to jump in and and uh, help guide us through uh, the various statutes that apply to law enforcement. Um, it's helpful for us to have this in context. Um, so committee, that is all we have testimony for for today. Are any of you um, have any lingering questions that you wish you'd asked one of the chiefs earlier because we do still have them for another few moments. And if there's anything else that you wanted to uh, to ask, JP. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have any questions, but uh, just a personal thank you. Uh, Chief Bombardier, it's good seeing you again, Tim, if only on Zoom. And Chief Pete, I've never met you, but uh, welcome to Vermont. And I wish you the best of luck in your, your appointment. And I'm sure you'll do well for the city of Montpelier. Thank you all. Take care, John. That is, uh, that is an excellent um, thank you. And I would like to extend that as well to both of you for taking time out of your day to, to come and, uh, and help share your perspective of municipal law enforcement with, uh, with citizen legislators who are immersing themselves in this, um, in this issue in hopes that we can um, help our fellow Vermonters uh, feel 
feel more confidence in and um, uh, and security from our police forces. So I appreciate your help with this. And if you have any follow-up thoughts afterward, don't hesitate to reach out to the committee. You can find a way to email the committee from, um, from our legislative website. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. All right, before we end our meeting today, um, just wanna loop back to S220. Um, although, um, Chief Pete, before you leave, um, you you happen to be sitting with the committee that uh, that has just passed a bill on uniform licensing standards to allow people to move between states a little bit more easily and get their pro professional credentials. So when you brought the the issue of how challenging it is to get a provisional and 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 get all of your certifications, I was thinking, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> Maybe we ought to. Maybe we ought to take that up, committee, because um, I think uh, I think Vermont could do well by um, enticing a few more good police officers like Chief Pete to to come and and uh, serve here in Vermont. So we, you, we may want more information from you on on your experience. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. And if I may also add, uh, it, it it does work into that strategic plan and the goal of the council of the legislation uh, of the governor of attracting diverse officers. And if we can pull from other states and bring the good ones here, I think it'd be a win-win for everybody. Bingo, I agree. All right, so on 220, we've got it coming to the floor this afternoon, assuming, um, assuming the budget debate doesn't take hours and hours. Um, Mike and Hal, are you guys ready to roll on that? Yes, and I, I just um, saw an email from the speaker, and looks like looks like it's going to be scheduled for tomorrow for caucus of the whole and vote. Oh, okay. So, so, so not, not not today. Hmm. I, I think caucus. yeah. That's what I'm just reading. She just sent out an email at ten o three. I, I saw that as well, and, and um, so I didn't know if Sarah had any um, updates other, other than that. And the other question I think Sarah was, you know, this went to other committees, but I don't think they, um, I don't know the process for for how to how to work that. If we need to, uh, if they'll be reporting, and yep. and that comes at the end of our process. Yep, you will make your floor report and then the Ways and Means report will come out and they will report a vote. Um, there was no amendment, so there won't be anything to uh, of substance to report. And then the Appropriations Committee should also have a reporter. And, um, and then you'll be open for interrogation, which means that you guys will need to figure out you know, who's, who's going to answer interrogations in what sections of the bill um, so that you can defer if you need to, to, to the right person. Um, right. Hopefully if you give a concise um, explanation of the bill at caucus of the whole, hopefully people who have questions will reach out to you, you know, between caucus of the whole and when it comes to the floor. Um, That's the plan. That's the ideal. That's the <laughs> ideal scenario. Um, and caucus of the whole is streamed for the universe to watch as well. So, so that's your that's your moment in in the spotlight. So, have fun with it. Um, any other questions from committee on on S two twenty or what we're expecting going forward? All right, that is it for our meeting for the day. And uh, we will see you all on the floor later, but then again in committee tomorrow. And we can go off live.